Whenever I speak, I always give this quote. We have had over 6,000 years of history with the domesticated horse and only 100 years with the automobile. I devised this little timeline so you might see it visually. Um, the timeline is from 4000 BCE to the current. And you can see we've had all of those years of history and there's only a little icon of an, uh, an automobile in the lower right hand corner. So only 100 years with the automobile and I dare say people don't understand the significance of the horse in that 6,000 years. The horse, when put to the wheel, it added strength uh, and speed. The wheel gave no stopping to the spread of culture, language, and technology around the world. In a World War I presentation on the horse, I call it the unsung hero. It was also the unsung hero and gave impetus for the building of carriages. The carriages led to the roads and bridges. If you rode a horse, you could swim him across the river. But once you've got a wheeled vehicle, you now need roads and bridges. And those roads and bridges gave rise to the automobile. The speed at which development traveled once the horse was linked with the wheel is quite remarkable. We see here Roman roads we see um, the early Chinese, we see a street scene in early America to show the rapid development of civilizations once the horse and the wheel were. We'll talk just a little bit about early history before the horse and the wheel were around. Historians like to talk about history in ages. Uh, the Old Stone Age was called the Paleolithic Age, and it ran from about 5 million to 10,000 BCE. It's called prehistory in that we don't have any written records, but we do have artifacts that have been uncovered by archaeologists. And man was basically hunted and scavenged and uh, gathered uh, to survive and used very primitive stone tools, ropes. Uh, they had domesticated dogs and dogs were used uh, in hunting and they also had understood the use of fire for warmth and uh, cooking of food. But transportation primarily consisted of, of walking. When uh, they transported things, because they were walking, they carried things or bundled them with ropes and dragged things. And of course, they dragged their game back from the hunting fields and the fish and the water and the food. Sometimes they would uh, um, uh, drag people around, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, that was the primary means of transportation. But it was the first step in the creation of a carriage as we know it today. In this Welsh drawing you can see a depiction of how it might have worked. The Neolithic Age or New Stone Age um, was a culture from about 8,000 to 4,000 BCE and permanent settlements came about uh, because of the development probably of systematic agriculture and also the domestication of other animals such as reindeer and oxen. And they were the animals that were first put into draft before horses. During this period of time before the horse was domesticated, uh, there was more advanced stone tools and also the development of pottery. The new Stone Age saw these towns and villages which necessitated greater trade and commerce. In the greater need for transport and particularly larger amounts of materials dictated a new way of doing things and we see the emergence of what we call the sledge. It would have been a vehicle that would have been pulled by either a man or an animal. Sledges are very important. You might call them a sled. Here are some examples of early uh, sledges. And it was interesting, uh, even though those sledges were used 6,000 years ago, we see today, or at least in 2005, they were used in the Philippines. This system of transportation has still not been abandoned. You can see the yoke across the neck of this carabao or swamp water buffalo. It's the national animal of the Philippines and still being used today. 
And here's a gentleman uh, with his water buffalo pulling a sledge. Oh, I got to ride the water buffalo too. That was one of my goals in going to the Philippines. This is a 10-year-old bull, bull uh, carabao. And they gave me a towel for saddle. Their skin is very smooth but has prickly hairs. So the towel was greatly welcomed. And you drove the water buffalo with and also rode it with what we call a jerk line. It's the same type of um, driving system that we would have used with our Conestoga wagon horses of the 1800s. A left uh, turn was indicated by a steady pull and the right turn were a series of jerks or today our today's horsemen might call them half halt. The horse though was a great improvement above the reindeer and the uh, bovine. Why was the horse so important? Well, it's speed and size. You guessed it. It had the ability to carry weight on its back and it had the ability to move into a harnessing system and to drag weight or to pull weight. Its anatomy also contributed to its advantage uh, as man's companion. Its hooves were hard so it could go many more miles than a bovine. Its digestive system was different. It's a cecum digestive system rather than a ruminant. The um, reindeer and cow would have to eat their food, uh, lie down and rest, regurgitate their food, remasticate it, or in some instances called chewing their cud, uh, before they could get back to work again. Well, a horse can eat and run just like man can eat and run. Its social abilities also and its herding instincts and its hierarchical uh, social systems also helped man in that once man could establish himself as the leader of the herd, uh, he could train that horse to do all sorts of things and to be his companion in the development of, of uh, world civilization. We, during our lectures on what we call the um, the great uh, greatness of uh, the horse, we look at the um, domestication of a whole lot of animals in the year in which they were domesticated. And we ask our students generally to understand or to think why was the horse so late in this uh, uh, timeline of domestication. The dog we can imagine might have uh, been carnivorous like we were and come to the campfire of the caveman and uh, maybe grabbed hold of a bone that was cast aside from uh, the uh, caveman's meal. Uh, so he might have been closer and closer to man to be domesticated very early. Sheep, goats were domesticated, swine, cattle and reindeer. But why was that horse so late in domestication? Well, most people can gather it. He's bigger and stronger and faster. And there was no stopping man uh, once he captured that horse. Its speed delayed the domestication, but once that speed was harnessed, it sent man into another world. The horse was used for all sorts of things. Early on, it was used for food. Once it was captured, uh, meat and milk. They have the uh, post uh, post-production revolution which uh, kept the horse into the ranks of, of sheep and that they kept them alive for the horse's muscle, power, and speed uh, rather than its meat and food or you kept the sheep alive for its wool rather than for its, uh, for its meat. Uh, the horse was used for all sorts of things, herding, warfare. We're going to talk most about its, its development as a, an animal for transportation. It was used for communication, agriculture, trade, on and on, religion, gifts, Oh, everything you can think of in today in competitions and recreation. The slide car. We're going to look at another um, adaptation that in man's history that might have led to uh, the cart, the two wheel cart, and that's the slide car. With the taming of animals, man realized that he could carry and pull his burdens, and so the slide car was probably one of the early. Uh, systems used by particularly nomadic cultures that didn't say settled long enough to manufacture a wheel. You can see that a simple basket on a slide car could have added to its ability to carry things from place to place. 
Life in the Americas without horses is interesting because uh, the Spaniards uh, brought the horses uh, with them in the 1400s. But most people don't realize that Native Americans were living in a Stone Age culture before the horse arrived. They had no wheel, no wheeled vehicle, because they had no large animal to put into draft. It was those Spaniards that brought those horses and the hogs and the cattle to the Americas. In fact, once the horse was here, Native Americans took advantage of it and captured the animals that were left behind by the Spaniards. Uh, and because they didn't have sedentary cultures for the manufacture of wheels, they used the slide car. It's called a travois by the French, uh, and it was the French term for a slide car. The wheel, though, was a great improvement uh, for man to have understood how to use the wheel. How did that all come about? Well, probably man realized that he could roll things much easier uh, than dragging them from place to place. This theory abounded, uh, and most people believe this is how uh, early man realized that they could use and benefit from what is now called wheel. The vehicles were invented approximately 4000 BCE uh, and extensively used in Mesopotamia. The early wheel was mounted to a rotating axle, which is interesting, and this is much like uh, is used in railroads today. So um, tight turns were a bit difficult. Um, if you know railroads today, they don't make a lot of tight turns. They're generally straight. So this rotating axle served um, the railroad very well, but not those people that were driving carriages. The early wheels were probably just a cross section of a tree uh, or a couple pieces of uh, lumber or wood being lashed together. Uh, there are two-piece wheels, one-piece wheels, three-piece wheels. The sledge becomes a carriage. Ah, if we just add one couple of those wheels or four of those wheels to a sledge, now uh, you've got a carriage. Here's a, an early depiction of a carriage um, in a Sumerian city-state, uh, and it's in the early Bronze Age period. The, it shows a combination of a sledge and the wheel. It adds to the theory that this is how the carriage might have evolved. The, the slide car uh, becomes a cart, as you can see by just adding some wheels. The advantage of the horse and wheeled vehicles uh, was great. Uh, if you go off to war, I'm always telling people a man can carry about 50 pounds. And if you go off to war or transporting something someplace and you've got a horse, you can pack about 200 pounds on the back of that horse. But if you take a man with a horse and a wheeled vehicle, you can transport twice the horse's weight. And here you see a very laden carriage in the 1800s transporting uh, goods from place to place. My brother, who's a mechanical engineer, he gives me this little simple dissertation on a uh, wheel and uh, how to describe the mechanical advantage of the wheel. It's a uh, lever with a fulcrum type um, uh, simple machine uh, and he talks about uh, the radius of the wheel is the effort arm and the radius of the axle represents the resistance arm. He did this nice little diagram for me that shows a 2,000 pound carriage being pulled by a 1,000 pound horse with only 50 pounds of force into the collar. Here are some early illustrations of wheel. A solid wheel on the left and a three-piece wheel on the right. Oxen were driven first, as we told you, uh, with a uh, yoke-type harness. And we can see illustrations here of that yoke-type harness uh, across oxen. The early uh, chariot harness uh, 
and the early harness for horses what actually came from the harness that was used for oxen. It's called a neck and girth or a classical harness by Joseph Needham and these are his illustrations of the evolution of the harness which we'll talk about just a little bit later. Here are some early clay figures of wheeled uh, chariots. And one of the earliest depictions that you can see if you go to the British Museum is what we call the Standard of Ur. This is one of the early depictions of an equine type uh, animal, in this case an onager, put to a battle car. And this box was found in a burial site in Ur, which is now modern-day Iraq. It is the earliest depiction of equine uh, animals in draft. The animals that were pulling it were believed to be onagers, um, wild asses sometimes. They were controlled with a jerk line. In other words, a single rein in the nose of these animals. It was bovine influence, the harness and the system of driving. They used a yoke type harness. And this yoke type harness was really quite impractical due to the weight of the vehicles uh, because oftentimes it would pull against the windpipe of the animal. Here's some early artwork depicting that those types of harness uh, and showing horse-drawn vehicles used in by the Babylonians and also the Sumerians. Horses and wheels, we know about them from early burial sites. We can see here an ancient burial site where the carriage is buried with the skeleton and the with horses and you can see their skeletal remains. Wheels were all over the world. The Chinese uh, used wheels, and here's a burial site uh, with the carriages with many spoked wheels. Another early depiction is a uh, four abreast chariot in 2500 BCE in the Middle East. The first field wheeled vehicles were heavy and awkward. You can see them at the bottom. They were clumsy. Uh, they had rotating axles, which you can see at the depiction at the top. Uh, they had this bovine influenced harness system. And they were used almost exclusively in ceremony. Here's an early Roman wheeled vehicle. It's essentially a platform on wheels uh, and the axles that turned along with the wheels. So there were some vast improvements and innovations that came about. The fixed axle with rotating wheels helped in the turning and preventing the turnover of vehicles. And the single uh, shafts or shafts for a single animal to pull a carriage was an improvement as well. Wheels got lighter. Wow, innovation is coming about. The early examples of three-part wheels that had holes in them to reduce the weight. And obviously the development of spoked wheels greatly decreased the overall weight of the wheel and still maintained its strength. The spoked wheel first appeared around 2400 BCE in Asia Minor. The horse seemed to have emanated from this region as well. That's why we say the horse and the wheel rather grew up together. Uh, this meant uh, the lighter wheel allowed uh, for the construction of lighter and swifter vehicles. Um, the spokes uh, and the harnessing of the horse seemed to date from the same time and place. The early 12-spoke and 8-spoke wheel here you see on an ancient Syrian chariot. Horse-drawn and bovine-drawn carriages. Here you see a Syrian chariot equipped with spoked vehicles. You have the bovine on the right and the equine on the left. 
the chariot. Wow, this improvement really mattered. The birth of the lightweight horse-drawn vehicle changed the world. The use of bits and bridles allowed for better control of the horses, uh, rather than the old-fashioned jerk line that was uh, fred through the nose and very much bovine influenced. The vehicles had become lighter weight for horses to pull due to the anatomically inadequate neck and girth harness system that we saw that was used for bovines. This was the first type of harnessing system used on the chariot. Horse-drawn chariots uh, made mostly of wood, had spoke wheels, uh, in some cultures weighed less than 100 pounds. Uh, in doing so, the strength was sacrificed for speed because now they've got a speedy animal, so they need a speedy vehicle. Uh, these vehicles could be dismantled uh, and easily placed on boats for uh, crossing rivers. They came apart, the wheels came off, the, body, the pole came away from the body of the uh, chariot, and it could be easily transported. The horses could be, could be swum across the, the river. Uh, these chariots were used for hunting. You can see this, this picture is depicting uh, the chariot used for hunting. So they were ceremonial platforms, hunting platforms, uh, platforms for warfare. The harnessing system, though, again, we're going to go back, was this neck and girth type harnessing system uh, used by the bovine. So the breast collar strap didn't come along until uh, some years later. In fact, it was in China. The Chinese uh, were really masters at inventing um, very early practical uses of the horse. And they started using the breast strap harness in 480 BCE, whereas it did not arrive in Europe until about 500, uh, the common era or AD. The full collar harness was in China about 100 BCE and didn't arrive in Europe until the 700s AD. So here's an example of that early neck and girth chariot harness that was used that was anatomically not well suited for the horse, but worked well because we got lightweight chariots into battle. And the first recorded battle in history uh, talks about these chariots these uh, that were taken to battle. In fact, it's the largest chariot battle in history, including probably many more than even 5,000 chariots. Uh, the Hittites came down from the north, and the Egyptians came up from the south, and they met in uh, a, on a river city called Kadesh. And uh, Joseph Needham talks a lot about this battle. There seems to be no real winner in this battle, but the battle did result in the first known uh, peace treaty. In fact, um, the original peace treaty uh, resides in a museum in Turkey, but uh, the, a copy of it is actually in the halls of the United Nations. So uh, this chariot battle is uh, a predecessor to the first peace treaty. The Greeks, Greeks had lightweight chariots uh, with two horses. Uh, as I told you, the chariots oftentimes weighed less than 100 pounds. And uh, here is an example of an Egyptian chariot. Uh, the axle moved now to the back side of the um, uh, chariot. Um, this reproduction that's on the right is in the Florida Carriage Museum, so you can actually come and see a reproduction of an early, early chariot. This is the one that was found in King Tutankhamun's tomb. It was all dismantled in the corner so that King Tutankhamun of, of um, Egypt might be able to use it in his afterlife. Here's an early Roman uh, vehicle with spoke wheels, a Carpentium. Um, styled after the Roman chariots, uh, and as here it's drawn by a pair of horses. The advantage of the horse increased human travel speed ten times over that of the oxen and mule. It was the first thing that allowed man to go faster than his two legs could carry him on land. It was 
uh, more impressive and intimidating than oxen and mules. Um, it had uh, a comfortable place to sit also on the back of a horse. It was a cat the horse and chariot linked together was a catalyst for change. It served for economic change, political change, social change and the in the developing ancient world. In fact, John Keegan in the History of Warfare uh, indicates that man was driving chariots into battle for about a thousand years before they were riding horses to war. Uh, the chariot was responsible for the rise and fall of empires. And the noble horse and chariot was an icon unequaled uh, and oftentimes depicted in the heavens or in the clouds in various stories, ancient stories. Uh. The oxen and mule were still used at this period of time to do the heavy hauling because the horse was sought to be so valuable for its speed and strength in warfare, the nobility really lashed on to the horse. Uh, most four-wheeled vehicles were too heavy for horses uh, to pull with a neck and girth type harness. So that was left to the bovines. Horses were considered too noble, as I said, and in many of the ancient states the lower classes were forbidden uh, to own horses because horses meant you had political power, strength, all of that sort of thing. wheel and yoke type harness. Uh, here's another uh, well-made example of a four-wheeled carriage used by uh, Eurasian nomads. The Chinese had heavy-duty carts and used the yoke type harness initially also, but as their carts got heavier and heavier, uh, and they wanted to carry more weight, it necessitated the invention of a different type of harness because they needed to effectively use the horse with its additional speed. So the Chinese invented a better harness. Uh, the breast strap came about, as I said early on, and here's uh, Chinese um, S-shaped shafts, which are very similar to our uh, gigs that we uh, drive today. Uh, so they uh, invented the breast collar and the breeching uh, and eventually the full collar for the horse and as I told you in 100 BCE and it didn't arrive in Europe until the 8th century. The Romans though, Romans did a lot of technological improvements to the wheel and the carriage. They used horses to pull domestic vehicles. They used their ingenuity to create and adapt a wide range of vehicles that would serve European society for thousands of years. Their wagons were unsurpassed surpassed in engineering and technological improvements until well after the medieval uh, Europe. Here's a chart of the types of Roman carriages that there were. Here's a spoked vehicle with uh, four horses or a quadriga chariot. Uh, here are some of the innovations, not only spokes, single piece fellies, banded iron rims, um, axles reinforced with iron bushings, iron hub rings to strengthen the hubs, uh, an interior uh, lined with uh, metal as the wheel turned allowing for uh, easier wear and longer wear of the hub and axle. They invented front pivoting axles that we know today is sometimes described as a fifth wheel. They invented and used suspensions. Here you see uh, suspension with uh, either uh, the bodies independently suspended from the undercarriage. We know about these suspensions because we have uncovered these suspension supports around Europe. 
and as you know, because the Romans had wheeled carriages or chariots, they developed roads. They developed roads and bridges. They had actually constructed 250,000 miles of roads all over Europe, all the way up into Hadrian's, to Hadrian's Wall in Great Britain. These roads and bridges were used not only for their legions, but for the battle cars that had to carry all the supplies for their conquering warriors. Sedan chairs and litters were used uh, for short distances. Horses and mules were used to pull vehicles for longer distances. Travel. Generally, travelers owned their own vehicles and traded for fresh horses. Various wagons could also be rented outside of city gates. Uh, couriers and government officials took advantage of post routes uh, and changed out horses at regular intervals, just like we did in the American developing of the American West. Correspondence, um, where there were no public post systems, slaves delivered mail or messages. And on foot, a person could cover about 26 to 27 miles in a day. But a uh, um, animal to a cart uh, could cover 40 to 50 miles in a day. And a letter sent from Rome took 21 days to reach uh, Athens and 33 days to reach Great Britain. The fall of the Roman Empire meant the decay of a lot of things. Um, their technology disappeared. Uh, the construction of carriages uh, didn't totally disappear, but was um, very much lessened. It had a significant impact on travel. Roads were in decay. Uh, there was a breakdown in the economy, communication and social linkages were cut off, the infrastructure uh, tr and travel around Europe was uh, very much hampered. Um, there were effects in that cities were depopulated, there was a decline in craftsmanship, decline in available resources because uh, transport was made much dif more difficult. The economies were crippled. Uh, there was a decay of that Roman network of roads. In fact, uh, Queen Boudicca or Boadicea, whichever way you want to pronounce it, um, she was one of the uh, influencing factors in Great Britain and tried to defeat the Romans' occupation of, of Britain. Tribes from the Germanic world, also the uh, Ostrogoths, uh, they moved, bumped up against one another and bumped up against road, uh, Rome. Uh, and they had horses and chariots too um, and helped to contribute to the decay of the Roman Empire. They were considered barbarians. Um, don't know whether they would have been many people. It's I guess it's a point of view. Um, innovation was gone. They abandoned roads, Roman roads. Uh, Metalwork uh, was greatly diminished because of lack of resources. Iron bushings and hubs, um, banded wheels. All of these thing, these innovations were uh, were pretty much abandoned and not reinvented until um, after 1775. So suspension systems disappeared and the horses uh, became uh, more domestic laborers rather than prized animals of war and transportation.